Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, tech talk that Singular is organizing again. We, this time we are going to talk about uh, Kafka. Uh, particularly, we are going to give some tricks, um, some piece of advice on how to use Kafka, learn a little bit about it. Probably, hopefully, it's going to be uh, good for everybody to learn more about Kafka. Um, my idea is try to present here some contents uh, for all skill set levels so that everybody can follow what I'm saying here. Uh, obviously, this is a technical talk, but I try not to get too, too technical so that this kind of uh, good for everybody. Uh, another thing I would like to say is that this is an open forum, open for for collaboration, everybody's welcome to ask any questions or or anything that you want to know more. All right. So first off, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. Um, many of you probably know me. I'm a technology enthusiast with uh, more than 19 years of experience, 13 of which I've been working here at Singular, uh, mostly as a Solution architect and principal cloud engineer. I I like a lot and I enjoy transforming problems into solutions. That's basically what I what I do, and what I what I enjoy a lot. And another thing I I do is I put a lot of effort and always try to create robust and scalable applications. Um, and lastly, here is that today I think everybody is moving to the cloud, so I'm primarily focused on creating cloud architectures. The, I'm certified in different technologies, but here I'm just highlighting the most relevant. One of them is a Confluence Certified Developer for Apache Kafka, AWS Certified Solution Architect, Certified Kubernetes Application Developer, MongoDB certified developer. All right. So before we get started here, this is the the overall agenda that we are gonna cover throughout this uh, this uh, session. We will start checking on a high level what is uh, Kafka, what are the properties that we are gonna find there, learn some misconceptions about Kafka more more get more details about the internals and its guarantees know about the state how important it is to uh, know how, uh, what are the impact if you create an application that has a state versus a one that doesn't have a state then how to do branching emerging branches or working with multiple um, topics or, or the stream simultaneously and some some tips as well about how to handle data flow control. Um, following that, we will also talk a little bit about um, event deduplication in the potence. We will cover joints. That's basically a very, very important topic. Uh, approaching to the end, we will talk about how to bring in data to Kafka, then transform it and do whatever you need Follow, following that how to export it and get it to other target systems beyond, beyond Kafka. Um, finally, we will talk about uh, some tips and tricks on how to make your application scalable and cover some scenarios in which I think that uh, Kafka is a good fit. All right, so let's get started. First thing here, I'm going to just read this, this sentence, which is uh, what is Kafka. Kafka. Apache Kafka is an open source project for a distributed public subscribe messaging system, rethought as a, di as a distributed commit log, commit log. So here you see this is a simple sentence, but we've said a lot of things here. First thing, what is, what is a commit log? Um, a commit log is is a very old technology. It's been used in uh, many many old systems. Uh, basically, the idea here is you do uh, you need to write a, a record, then you write the record in the file. Following the following time that you need to do a change, you append it. 
and the following change you do you append it and the following do you append it and then following like that what you're doing is sequential writes um this is extremely efficient way of writing data to disks even today with new ssds this is also very efficient and based on the simplicity of that mechanism is what, what everything around kafka is built on um to make it more robust we need to introduce the concept of distributed the distribution that we have for those files is what make it more what makes it more uh, reliable and uh, so that we, we we have high availability and fault tolerance. Um, then the following thing that we also said here is we said that this uh, publish subscribe messaging system. In reality, Kafka is is um, very similar to a certain degree on on the way that uh, traditional queues work in which you just uh, subscribe to a queue and then you are waiting for messages to show up. When there is a new message, then you read it. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that because it allows allow us, it has some things that allow us to scale out. Obviously, the way I said is just a, a very, very high level. Um, and this is the, the the overview that you can that you need to remember uh, for starters uh, on how Kafka how Kafka works. And um, in this diagram that you see below, this is also very high level. You see that we have a source system, then we have something that we are gonna check later, which is Kafka Connect that allows us to bring data from different external source systems get the data loaded in kafka and once we have done all the transformations and uh, modify the data the way we need then we can also push it to other different target systems all right so first off here is all right we already know very high level how kafka is um Okay, how can I produce a message? What is the format of a message? Okay, the, the message is just a, a queue. It's, it's created in a key value format, and then you can typically have like a key, and then a value, and another key, and the value. So um, in Kafka, uh, all it cares is just a, a sequence of bytes. You can put any content that you want. It doesn't need to be a string or numeric value or, or or JSON format or Avro, it can be it can be binary format. For example, you can have like uh, IDs in numeric format, and then the content could be uh, an image or, or videos or whatever you want. It's not recommended to put a very too large uh, content, but technically it's possible as long as you put whatever you want in in, in represented with binary format. That's good enough. Um, there is a special type of record that is so-called tombstone, which is having a special meaning. Uh, here you have like a sample. This is three, which is the, the key of the record. And then the value is no, it's no. And records with no value as, as, uh, as so-called tombstone records. Just for you to know, this is the terminology that we use in the, in the Kafka jargon. Um, also, uh, Kafka store messages in, in topics that are partitioned and replicated uh, across multiple brokers in a cluster. The, the producer uh, are the ones that send messages to, to the cluster in Kafka, and then we have a number of consumers that are reading the data from Kafka. Um, very important thing here that we need to no, and one of the guarantees that we get from Kafka is that we can we can only read data in order, right? This is for a partition, as we will see later. In this in this diagram, you can see something that is more uh, closer to what you usually do see when you are creating your own Kafka application. For example. You see here that we have three producers and they are just reading a number of topics. It could be one or many. Uh, every topic has a number of partitions in which the data is distributed across. And then see, in the same way, we also have consumers. A consumer can read from one or more or more topics. And then from, 
from here you can just do whatever you need to do with the uh, with the data and transform it the way you need it okay um as you saw in the previous in the previous uh, diagram we have we can have multiple partitions for a single topic so this is this is the the core on how uh, an application in in Kafka is able to scale to scale out um, pr producers and uh, when are when they are submitting uh, records or messages uh, to Kafka um, depending on the partition assignment strategy the the those records are gonna be stored in one partition or another. The partition assignment the strategy is using the key of the record and based on that applies kind of like a, a hashing function that determines which partition the record is going to be allocated on. So one uh, very important concept that we all need to remember is whenever you have one key, it doesn't matter what the value is, the, the, the partition that the record is going to be assigned is always going to remain the same. In other words, same key message will always be assigned to the same partition. So let's say, for example, that you are partitioning here the data, maybe by user ID or whatever. You have the guarantee that, for example, if we have a user with the ID one, two, three, and then we are doing like a number of changes, changing the information associated uh, to that user. That means that every time that we write up data for that user is always going to be assigned to the same partition and their changes are going to remain sorted. They're going to remain in the, in the order that the data was produced. So this is a good thing for the consumers to have the guarantee that they are going to read the data in that order. Um, another thing that is, is um, important to remember is that uh, consumers read messages uh, from different partitions independently. Okay, A consumer can read from multiple topics. At the end, within the topics, we have partitions. And there could be one or more consumers reading the same partitions and topics at the same time, each of them at, at their own pace. And when we have multiple a partition with a lot of sorry a topic with a lot of partitions, and then you want to kind of ha spread the load, uh, uh, split the load across multiple applications, then we can use what uh, something that we call in Kafka a consumer group. Uh, we will talk later more in detail on what a consumer group is and, uh, and how it works. All right. Um, yeah, another another important thing here is when you are writing to Kafka, everything is a topic, but the way that you're processing the data is is only possible through two types of abstractions. One is the Kafka streams, which are basically just representing a time-based sequence of events. Right, so this, if you are submitting a number of records, records one, two, three, four, five, then you are gonna exactly replicate that in, in, in Kafka and then you're gonna read it in the same order. Another thing is uh, tables. Tables are another type of abstraction that are representing a change log of stream events that each record is an update on a primary key table, basically. What, what you see here when you have a table is that the, the table is keeping track on, on what was the last um, record for one given key. So for example, if you have user one, two, three with whatever values, and then you are doing multiple updates, and then after those updates are written to Kafka, I have a consumer that starts reading as a table, what this is going to find is just the last the last record, which is the one that you are, you are keeping in the in the table. All right. Um, there is something that we call in Kafka the string table duality, which basically is the, the idea that since in Kafka everything is just topics, when you use a stream, 
you can convert the string into a table or a Kafka table and also the other way around, right? You can go from a table to a string or from a string to a table. You can navigate in one way or the other. Okay, so, so for, for example, here you can see like a, a sequence of, of changes that are occurring here in, in, a, in a, this should be a, an animated GIF, but it's okay for some reason it's not working now. Uh, you can see that the, the, the sequence of changes that we're doing here, and then if we are applying, for example, a count to see what, how, many, how many locations uh, every, every person is doing, all right? For example, here you see that the key is the name of the person followed by the value, which is the location that was traveling recently. And then we wanna see how many different locations every, every traveler has been visiting recently. So here we have the, the stream, and then you see here the sequence of, of events that were produced. And then the value of the table is gonna be based on what we get in the change log stream. The change log stream is like a, a copy of the original stream in which we are keeping the result of our computation. So in the first step, when we get Alice Van Perry's, we are gonna do a count by, by Alice, and then we are gonna see, okay, we this is the first record we have, so we are gonna keep uh, number one. So at this moment, if I go and check in my table and see, okay, give me the value for Alice, I'm gonna get a one, okay? Because this is the current status that we have at this precise moment. Following that, we get another record for Bob, this traveling to Sydney, um, the same the same thing happens here. We count the locations that Bob has been traveling to recently, and then we see that this is also one. All right. So the next the next record that we get in this time is Alice decides to visit uh, Rome. Rome, uh, and in this in this case, you see that the count is increased to two. So in this moment. If I go and check my table and I see what the values are for Alice and Bob, I'm gonna find that the last record for Alice is two, so that's the count, and the last record for Bob is one. You see that the previous record is kind of overridden to a certain degree, it's like not, not available because the table is only keeping track of, of the last value. And then you can see how this is working. At the end, what we get is, Alice is, is visiting three, three locations and Bob visited two. And the change log is, is later uh, serialized to disk um, using RocksDB that we probably are gonna see also later. And this is also helping for performance. All right, any, any questions this, this moment? All right. Okay, so now we are gonna talk about some misconceptions that I've, I've often, uh, often times seen people getting confused with those. So we just, we just talked about what Kafka is and I think it's the time to say what Kafka is not, all right? We will um, talk later about some more details and we will have time to explain some of the concepts concepts that you need to know to fully understand why I'm saying the Kafka is not this or is not that. But just for you to keep in mind the rest of the session, um, you know and don't get, uh, don't get confused with that. First thing is Kafka is not a relational database, all right? We have Kafka tables. Uh, you can do operations like joins that we are gonna cover later. But this is not exactly the same concept that you get when using a, a SQL a query in the SQL world, all right? Uh, also, Kafka is not a system that keeps unique records instances at primary level, right? So, um, there is something that we are going to cover also uh, in a few in a few moments which is compaction that uh, kind of can give you the feeling that you can get unique records in your in your topic but the reality is that does not that's not what this 
occurring for real. Okay. Um, you cannot also use Kafka as a data store that allows you to do random access. As you saw, you need to read the data sequentially in the same order that is being uh, pushed. All right. So no, don't get don't get full whenever you see that all right, I have unique records and I can read the data in random access. There are certain things in, in all honesty that you can do kind of like that using uh, Kafka caching and RocksDB that is implemented behind the scenes. There is also another concept that is called queryable queries that is, is built on, on top of, of change log streams and RocksDB. But you shouldn't you shouldn't approach Kafka as a as a random access uh, technology. It's, it's more intended to just process events as they come through. Um, finally, is not a system that allows you to delete committed records. Okay, um, so we 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 presented previously the concept of tombstone records, which have a, like a delete uh, meaning, a delete semantics, but is is something that you, if you are writing record one uh, with value A and record one with value B and record one with value C, you cannot go and delete the second instance, all right? The value one, record one with value B. You cannot do that. What you can do is submit another tombstone record, maybe say record one with value no. Okay, so that's, that's from a semantic perspective, kind of deleting the record from the topic, but it, but you still have three previous instances that are not null. Those are gonna remain there for quite a long time until compaction gets triggered. This is something that we also are gonna cover later, as I mentioned earlier. All right, any questions? Okay. Okay, so time to talk now about the guarantees that we have in Kafka. This this uh, section is is very important because we are gonna cover really foundational concepts that you need to understand to fully see how Kafka is working and what things you can do. The first thing that you already we already mentioned is that Kafka has multiple nodes and the concept of a node in Kafka or we also call it replica. So uh, Kafka has multiple replicas. Uh, typically what happens is when you have multiple replicas, one of them is going to step up as the leader at any given time, and it's going to be the one coordinating multiple different operations. And this is a very important thing that this is essential to understand why uh, Kafka is so, so uh, reliable and robust as a technology. Um, when 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 a message is is committed, all right, in all in all the different uh, uh, is committed in all the replicas and is is also written to disk. We say that the, all replicas are in in sync replica set. It's the ISR. So when when we get the ISR concept, that is that we know that. This is the number the number of of replicas that you need to get your your record written to this get the response that confirms that the operation was completed, and based on that you, we can get different different behaviors. So exactly around this, there are three types or three modes of acknowledgement, and they have different uh, different goals, and you should use them. Uh, depending on what the the properties of your system is, how what the data that you have, and what things you can you cannot do based on the nature of your data. So first one is when you get a, a ACKS zero or AX zero. This is basically saying, okay, I have a producer submitting records to Kafka, and I'm gonna just produce those records following a fire and forget pattern. Um, this is very good from the performance perspective, but obviously it doesn't give you any durability guarantees. And then you might wor might wonder, okay, in which case I'm gonna I could be interested in, in having a system that is just 
submitting records and doesn't really care whether they get written or not. 99.99% of the time, your records are going to be written perfectly in Kafka. You're not going to lose any records because Kafka is very, is very reliable. But since you are waiting for any type of confirmation, you don't have the, the you don't have any chance to retry in the case that a record doesn't get uh, fully uh, persisted on disk. Uh, good, a good case scenario that, that matches here is, let's say you develop an application that is kind of recording like the location for your fleet of tracks that are delivering different goods around the country. And every minute you are getting the geolocation on where your tracks are. So this is a perfect example in which what happens if you commit the location of one track and the record doesn't get committed. Okay, it doesn't really happen anything bad because in one minute after that, you're going to get another record that is going to give you what the location of your track is. And maybe you you can uh, allow, you can afford to, to lose a record. If that scenario works for you, if it doesn't really matter if you, if you uh, lose a record, uh, every now and then, that's fine because this this uh, approach is going to give you a lot of performance, and it's going to work really well for you. Moving moving on here, we we also can have X one, which is uh, the default before Kafka Kafka three zero, and here we are finding kind of like a balance between durability and um, performance. In this case, when when the producer submits a record. Is gonna just wait for the leader to confirm that it wrote the record to disk, okay? And then after that, it's gonna submit the next one. It's not gonna wait for other replicas to uh, also replicate and write the record to disk. Um, finally, the last mode that we have here is ax all, in which uh, you're waiting for all acknowledgement for all. Or replicas. Okay, this is the default uh, from from Kafka 3.0 onward, and um, it gives you the best durability. But obviously, because you need to wait for all the replicas to write the, the, the every record to this can return with a confirmation, is gonna hit a little bit the performance. Um, and those are the different delivery guarantees that we have for producers. Okay. So now it's time to talk about the other side, consumers. Okay, consumers also need to have some processing guarantees. This is what Kafka guarantees that you're gonna get when processing a record. So Kafka, same as many, many other distributed systems, provide different processing guarantees. The most uh, common ones are are the at most ones or at least ones, but Kafka is is going even further than that. This is, is giving us three processing guarantees mode, guarantee modes. Um, consumers can configure the processing guarantees that best match their needs. So you need to also evaluate how the data that you're getting is and um, how you want to process your data, and based on that, make your own decision. So. At most, at most ones is a um, processing method in which you we are just uh, following the best effort pattern. And uh, what happens here is you read the record and then you commit the change and after that you start processing. During the processing of your record, during the computation of your record, if your application fully blows up and fails, when another instance resumes and checks where you left it off, because you committed the record, you're not gonna have a chance to reprocess that record again, okay? So that record will be lost. Um, this is a decision that you need to make, whether that mode works fine for you or not, okay? Um, moving forward and going to a more conservative approach is the at least once. This is widely supported by many, many different distributed systems, same as at most, as most, at most ones, but at least once is like the more conservative, is a much more conservative approach than at most ones. 
In this case, what happens is you go, you read your record, you process it, and after that, you commit it. So during the processing, if you get an error because you didn't commit the record, you can process it again, all right? Or if your application blows up, the next instance of your application is gonna process it again. So that's why it says at least once. If your application blows up and the next instance processes your application, it's gonna be processed a second time, okay? In this case, the only the only little thing you need to see is that it could produce duplicates. So if, if that's not a big deal for you, this approach works great. Um, this is also the default mode for for Kafka before 3.0, right? Um, from Kafka 3.0 onward, uh, there is another mode that has been there for a while, which is exactly one. This is crazy in terms of the distributed system. Having an application that ensures or, 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 a, or a technology, a platform that ensures that records are processed exactly once in a distributed fashion. This is crazy. This is really, really powerful that we have such a advancement here, a breakthrough here in the, in the distributing computing. It relies strongly on transaction and even potent features, and it uses a very low commit interval. Those are things that we are gonna go deeper later as as we progress progress in the in the session. Okay, and here it is. We mentioned previously consumer groups. What are consumer groups for? All right. So let's say that you have an application that has a one to or you have one topic with all partitions like you see here, and maybe your, your topic is getting a huge amount of data. Obviously, if you had to process all the data with one single instance, there will be an upper limit beyond which you cannot process data any further than that. So in order to scale out and give you the ability to parallelize the computation and the data that you're getting, you can, you can create multiple partitions in your topic and assign your partitions to different applications. So um, the applications can cooperate uh, processing the data for that, uh, for that topic. Um, one important thing to remember is that one partition will be assigned exactly to one consumer within the same consumer group. So that means partition one here is only gonna be assigned to this consumer within this consumer group. This, this second uh, instance that belongs to the same consumer group cannot get partition one because it's already assigned to another member of the same group. Right, this is really important. And when when one node goes down, for example, one member of the group goes down or something, we need to do an operation that is called a rebalance that determines how to assign the the partitions of a topic across all the members of of a group. Another important thing that you see here is we have the same topic with the same number of partitions and the same data that is being processed differently but two different consumer groups right they are working completely independently they don't have any sort of relation whatsoever and they are capable of of um, processing the data at their own pace and do their own transformation they don't need to to know they are even consuming the the, the same data at all okay okay um time to move on to the next item Okay, so now we are gonna talk about state, which is really important concept. And of course, state models. Um, Kafka Streams API offers a number of operations, but depending on the operation that you choose, you will need to know that there are different requirements, all right? Uh, most of, of the relevant aspects of, of Kafka is, is one of very important aspects is to understand the difference between stateful and, and stateless operations. 
when when we say that an operation is stateless it means that we don't need any data uh, um, to be stored in order to complete the operation because any data needs to be persisted in order to complete the operation this is a really interesting feature a very good thing that we are gonna go deeper in the next slide Conversely, we can also say that when, when an operation is stateful, it means that we need to persist. It requires data persistence to complete that operation. Okay, so let's go now and understand what each oper type of operation is and what are the advantages of, of that. So state, stateless operations has uh, have a lot of advantages. The, the the most important one is performance. You are going to get the best performance when you're using uh, stateless operations simply because you don't need to read and do any any rewrite operations um, to check the state. You don't have a state. You, you have all the data you need just in your own operation. You can immediately uh, process it. The next thing is also they are more reliable and fault tolerant because, again, you don't have a state. You don't need to were uh, to do any maintenance and you don't need to worry about that okay so some of the most relevant stateless operations uh, that we have in kafka using the uh, uh, kafka stream api is uh, like for example these four operations that you see here so this is very simple so let's say this is a stream in which you are getting whatever type of users or whatever type of information so then you want to apply like a filter and make sure that some records are going to be discarded if they don't meet your your filtering criteria so then you're going to get a record represented here with the key and value and then this specific case i'm assuming maybe that this is a, a string and i'm just checking that the value doesn't have an invalid code whatever um, the next uh, operation that we can do is if we want to map the values. This operation allows you to transform the value portion of your record and produce other values. So in this example here, uh, we are just getting whatever value. And then here we are just um, getting getting the, the index of the value. This is... Um, Telling you what is the position of the da the dash, and then you you add one. The pick operation is good if you wanna just inspect, but you don't wanna do any type of operation, any sorry, any type of modification, any type of change. You just wanna see what the what values are going through your your stream. Um, this is a good operation if you wanna log or you wanna debug something. This is great for that. So as you can see here, we are getting the key and the value. In this specific case, we are just printing the content of, of our records as, as they go through. Um, finally, in these in these uh, examples that we have here, we are just um, having the two operation that allows you to serialize the data that you have in your stream to another topic. And here we have to need to indicate the format of the key and the format of the of the uh, value, the the service is is the, the 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 object that we use in Kafka to specify how to serialize and deserialize. That hence the word service, how to serialize and deserialize the key and the value of your records. Um, in the next thing that we are gonna look now is about the stateful operations we already saw how the stateless operations are stateful operations are needed when you need to collect data uh, and complete like a some sort of action that 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 is necessary to see what the state is okay kafka stores the state in a topic and is replicated locally and it uses rocksdb as the the first level cache for for doing all these transformations um, the considerations that we are here are primarily the same as the ones we saw for stateless basically just the opposite thing 
here one of the biggest impacts that you're gonna get when you use this stateful operation is if you change the topology of your application you need to drop all the caches and delete some internal change log topics and then you need to to do a lot more stuff the next thing is also a consequence of that. You need to maintain and replicate all that state as it evolves over time, right? And also it's gonna hit a little bit the performance because there is all that effort, extra effort about maintaining your data up to date requires the IO operations. Um, that means that when you do a change, it needs to be stored in the Kafka cluster and also in your local cache. So it's, it's every time that you do a change, you need to replicate that type of changes and operations. Some of the most relevant uh, operations that we have here in, in, in Kafka is, uh, for example, map. If you look here in the previous case, in the previous uh, slide, we talk about uh, map values, but here we are talking about just map. Uh, in this case, the operation is stateful because we are changing the key. Uh, potentially, this is what this operation is expecting, and that requires a repartition of your data because you are modifying the key, and that has a major impact. The next thing, the next operation is which you want to reduce, which basically is okay, you have, a, for example, say, a string of, of numbers, okay? Um, something like a, a key and a random number or a number of words or something. And then you, or maybe you have a, a like a word and, and then you have the key, you group by key. And then after that, you are able to get the two values that belong to the same grid, the same key or whatever number of values. And then you are able to sum up those and then produce another string. The group by, which is similar to this one, in this case, you are determining what the criteria is that you are grouping by. And here we are doing a count. Obviously, to do the count or to do the, 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 the reduction, you need to keep a state. You need to um, kind of check what the previous value is. And then when you get a new value, add it up or, or do whatever you need to do. OK. So now we are going to talk about branching and, and, and data, data flow control. So when, when, you have, when you have a stream of records, sometimes you could have multiple, uh, you maybe want to have like multiple substreams and do sub transformations based on the type of your of your records of your messages so in this sample i have here you can see for example like we got a stream in which we get albums for different uh, artists and then we wanna split we are getting maybe all the all different albums from from the 80s onward till, till the present and then we decide that we need to do different actions based on the decade that the the, the album belongs belongs to the, the the decade the album was released. So here we are splitting our stream, and then we are uh, appending a, a prefix, and then based on that we are gonna create different branches. Uh, for every branch, we are gonna put the condition that our our branch is gonna require in order to receive records. So in the first branch, we are gonna say, okay, so these are gonna be the records which value is not null and which year is before um, the nineties. So if the record is before the nineties, we are gonna call this. This is the the decade for the eighties. The following one is, is before the 2000 is, is the records for this is the, the, the albums for the for the for the, the 90s and everything else we are going to call it other. So when when we get the result here, we get like a map, which is kind of like a dictionary key value pairs in which we say, OK, we got the, the records for for the its branches is, is the map. 
we get the, the decade, the records for, for the decade of the 80s, and then we decide to do whatever operation we want. In this case, we are just pushing the records to a topic that is decade.80s. And then here, we're just pushing the records to another topic that is decade of 90s. Um, finally, for decade other, we decide that there is another one that this is if the name of the album is awful album, we are going to drop it. Everything else will be pushed to decade other. This is just a very simple dummy uh, sample that you can see how this works. So following following the, the branching, obviously, you sometimes want to merge multiple streams together. So this is also similar. As, as if you want to uh, merge in different streams is similar as reading also from multiple topics, okay? It's a very similar approach. Here we are, are covering um, merging multiple branches. If you want to read from multiple topics at the same time in the same, in the same stream, it's also possible and it's very simple to do. So let's say, for example, that we got, you have in the previous application, we did a number of changes in our topics, in our branches, and apply different criteria based on when the album was released. And after that, we want to combine everything again together. So we are going to extract all the first stream. This is going to return a stream. And after that, we are going to merge it with the stream that we got from the, from the 90s. And after that, we are going to merge it also with the, the ones that we got for the decade of the, 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 the remaining, the decade other, whatever other albums we got. And finally, we are serializing the three, the three branches that we merge together here uh, to another a new topic that we are going to call it decade all, in which we are going to have everything together in, in, the, same, in the same topic. Okay. So this is uh, just another way to put the data together. OK, so um, regarding data flow control, sometimes you want to decide how to uh, filter the data in a way or another and decide which records are going through and which records are not going through. For that, we have two operations. One is filter. The other one is just the opposite. It's just doing whatever conditions, just Negate it, so it doesn't require any special meaning beyond that. It's just a, a code issuer for your for your code. The same operation is implemented on the two object abstractions that we have in Kafka, streams and tables, but they don't work exactly the same way. When you apply a filter on a message that is in a stream. If the, if the message doesn't meet the criteria of the, that you put, the record is going to be discarded. So that means that the record will not go through. Uh, it's going to be dropped, in other words. However, if you do that on a table, what happens is the record goes through as a tombstone record. OK, so if you have, for example, in the table, three records, record one with value a, record two with value B, record three with value C. And then you apply a filter. You say record two, if the key is equals to two, uh, filter. OK? That means that if a record one is going to go through, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to pass uh, with the value. For record three, it's going to pass with the value. But for record three, the value B will not go through. What this is going to see is going to see a, a, a null value. This is a tombstone record. OK. Um, and finally, here in this uh, section, we are going to talk about suppress. Suppress is an operation that allows us to have more control on, on what changes are getting cascaded downstream and give you more more uh, management have better well, control again as uh, what data is being cascaded downstream to different to the different uh, systems this is important because sometimes for example if you are doing you're getting 
as many changes for one single key. Maybe let's say a user logs in in an application and you're, you're getting multiple events for, for the user. You don't want to kind of uh, overwhelm the system downstream. You want to kind of reduce the, the frequency in which we are cascading data downstream, like every minute or every five minutes or whatever criteria you decide. You can use the suppress operation that allows you to limit uh, using different windows or, or, or time frame or number of bikes or different criteria. What this is going to do within that criteria is going to kind of um, accumulate all the data and return the last value within that window or time frame. Okay. I've been using this in some projects, but and it's working fine. But the only the only uh, gotcha here is if you are not getting a continuous flow of events, it's kind of not working the way that you are expecting. Now what happens is let's say you're getting a lot of changes for for different records. And maybe you are for an hour that you didn't get any changes. The last record that was pushed is kind of getting hung in the in the application and it doesn't it doesn't go through until you start getting records again. So be careful when using this. All right. Okay, I think it's is now time to talk about the event the duplication or the importance, unless there are any questions at this point. Okay, good. Let me drink a little bit of water. Okay, so <clears throat> the concept of, of hidden potence refers to the ability of a system to submit uh, the same message multiple times without altering the result. And this is a key concept when you are working with uh, distributed systems in general and particularly for, for, for Kafka. This is very important uh, especially when you are working in, the, in any any cloud platform, because it's really really common that you need to face like a lot of network blips. So let's say your application is producing records and pushing those to Kafka, and everything's working perfectly. But what happens if at some at some point you get a network blip? Yeah, that means that your record is not gonna get the it's not gonna get the, the the cluster or you're not gonna get the confirmation that the record was written successfully all right so kafka comes with a built-in system that allows you to uh that allows uh, allows you to control this and you don't need to do anything it's gonna be a uh, taking care of, of its own so there could be two scenarios in which um a record can be lost if you don't if you don't have the hidden potence enabled. Let's say, for example, you submit a record, and then when when it's on its way, you the the record gets dropped, and it doesn't hit the it doesn't reach to the to the Kafka cluster because you don't doesn't he didn't hear from the Kafka cluster, you are gonna retry, all right? So if you retry second time, the record goes through and then it reaches the, the cluster and then the, cluster, the Kafka cluster writes the record and then you get a response. So you could, this time you know the record is fine. Another option, another case, very similar is you submit a record, the record traver, um, traverses the network, reaches the cluster, and the cluster sends you back the response confirming that the record is there. But the, while the, the, the response is, is, is traversing back to you, it drops because you have a network bleed. In this case, you didn't get the confirmation that the record was written. And because you didn't hear about anything about it, you, you might think it's the same case as before, and then you retry again. But this time, what you're doing is producing a duplicate. Which you retry. So what is going to happen is the Kafka cluster is going to get a second, for the second time, it's going to get the same record, 
um, is gonna process it. If you are getting a transfer of a five million dollar, you'll be super happy that you now have double double as much money. But but normally there is gonna be somebody else that is gonna be really pissed off because of that. In order to control that uh, automatically, what what Kafka has is the the implementation of the uh, idempotence, which basically is doing is adding a, a correlation ID in a header saying, okay, this is the record that I'm submitting every time. And then the Kafka cluster on their side is kind of keeping track of the, the, the IDs of the of that record. And when it sees a record that was committed previously for the second time, it just discusses it and returns the confirmation that the record was already written. And this way it doesn't it doesn't you don't need to worry about about getting duplications on the on the cl cluster side. Okay, the the next thing is extremely important. This is the the delivery the processing guarantees that we mentioned before, uh, but here we are gonna cover it a little bit more in depth. Uh, as I mentioned previously, most distributed systems are capable of providing at most once or at least once processing guarantees. I can think of, for example, SQS in, in AWS, which is kind of similar to certain degree, obviously not that powerful, that supports these two processing modes, but it doesn't, it doesn't have anything that gives you exactly one semantics. When, when, when we say that, the, that we have exactly one semantics, Kafka platform is capable of providing exactly one processing guarantees without loss or duplication of messages, meaning that the message processing is always accurate. This is crazy. This is something amazing that we have such a high, uh, strict and powerful processing guarantee. Uh, this this feature is is being implemented for some time, and from version 2.5 is just having like a feature, but is is simply you can enabling by setting this property. And when you do that, it automatically cascades and set a number of other attributes that are necessary to make this proper this um, this uh, processing guarantee possible. First one is it reduces a lot the the commit interval. That means how how uh, how frequently you are gonna commit your changes. But it's gonna set it to a, a, a hundred milliseconds. Although you can reduce it further if you want. This is the default value you're gonna put. If you put something beyond beyond that, I think that you get an error. The next thing is the replication factor. That means when you write a record, how many uh, replicas you need to wait for confirmation that your record is already persisted on disk, was written to disk. So this is gonna give you guarantees that in the case that one replica dies, you are gonna have at least another two replicas containing a copy of your record, okay? So this is uh, same thing. Is the the ICK is all is the to get the best delivery guarantees, and finally there are two features which is transactions and item potents that get enabled. In the case of item potents, is set like true like that by default. Um, because of the strong requirements that this feature requires uh, and needs, you need to be aware that this is gonna have some impact to the throughput. So be, be aware of that. Use it only when when you have a strong need from a, from a durability or from a processing perspective. Okay, so now it's time to talk about joins. Okay. Okay. So one of the most uh, powerful operations, or most commonly used at least, operations that you have in, in Kafka is the ability to put together data from different topics. You could have, I don't know, a topic with uh, users, another topic with addresses, and you want to combine the data together. So this is possible through through joins. And there are two types of joins that you can do in, in Kafka. They are primary key joins and foreign key, foreign key joins. Here we are gonna look th uh, through the, the primary key joins 
uh, for starters. And the main thing that you need to remember when talking, when working with primary key join is that they need to be co-partitions, co-partitioned. Uh, we say that the two topics are co-partitioned when they have the same number of partitions. So if you have, uh, for example, as we, you see here, the users, the user stream and the address stream. If the user stream has three partitions, you're gonna, you need to have also three partitions on the address stream. Or if you have ten partitions in the user stream, you need to have ten partitions also in the, in the address stream. If you have a different number, you're gonna get a mismatch and an exception. It's not gonna work. Your Kafka is gonna complain and won't allow you to do that. So, depending on the on the data abstraction that we have above, the, there are different possibilities. When I say the data abstraction, I mean stream or tables. There are different combinations of different operations that are allowed. So we are going to see the four possible combinations between a stream and a table uh, and see how, how that works and what the implications of each of those is. The first one is, OK. I want to join a stream of records with another stream of records. What happens here? Okay, first thing is because the stream of records doesn't have any state per se, you need to have um, a window, right? So this uh, you need to decide the determine the time frame that your records are gonna be joined together. Out of that window, if your records occur or they come late, they're not going to be joined together. So in this example here, in which we are joining two streams, we see user records coming through that get joined with address records. OK, so they are being joined by primary key. Obviously, that means that they, the, the, the key attribute of both types of records is the same. So they're going to join together. And then we are defining a join window of 60 seconds. So if I get user one and address one in a, uh, in a period of time that is within 60 seconds, they're going to be joined together. But if I get user one now and then I get the address maybe in three minutes, they're not going to join together because the record came out of the window. Okay. And here in the Operation in between is just decide, determine how you want to merge the two records in the case that there is a successful join. This, this is basically just creating an instance of another object that combines those two records. This is the same as you see here, getting the two individual records, and then we are creating an instance, passing the two attributes inside. This is an abbreviation. abbreviation. The next common way of joining records is, is if you have a stream and a table. In that case, you don't need a window, okay? Because, because as long as long as you get the record in the stream and the corresponding, there is a corresponding match on the table, you're gonna be successful. Okay. If you get that record here now on the user side and your corresponding match is already in the address table, you're going to get a match. However, if you get a record now, but you're, you don't have any the, the associated address in that precise moment already available in the table, you're not going to get any match. It won't join at all. OK, careful with that. <clears throat> the next option is joining two tables. OK, so when joining two tables, this is similar to the previous case, but there is a, there is an important difference. Every time the one either side of the join gets an event, the join is gonna be triggered. So maybe let's say I get a record right now for a user, and then in that precise moment, I'm gonna execute the join and see if there is an address associated with the same key on the address table. If I find it, this is going to produce a record, a join record. Similarly, if the operation occurs in reverse order, if I get the address first and then the user, the join is also going to be successful. Okay, if the moment I get the address, I already got 
the user, this is going to trigger a change. So either side is capable of triggering changes and that's going to cascade down. So the implications here is that you could get some sort of duplication when either side is changing, all right? So from the moment that you get the two, the two tables loaded with a with a, a key, a key and a value, the joining the the join it can be triggered from either side as many times and as those sides of the join are changing. Okay, and finally, <clears throat> that you cannot join a table with a string. There is no point in doing that, and it's simply not supported. Okay, so moving forward here. Now we are going to talk a little bit about foreign key joins. Foreign key joins were introduced not that long ago. It's a feature that is, is being long time awaited and is quite uh, complex. The way it's implemented is using a subscription mechanism, creates a number of topics behind the scene to make it possible. But Kafka is taking care of the Kafka API stream API is, is taking care of all those low level details and you don't need to worry that much. But the only thing that you need to be aware is that it's a little bit resource intensive. So be aware when using, you can use them, it's fine. But just if you can save some compute and you have other ways of getting the same thing, it's preferred if you don't. The concept here is that whatever you are joining, you're going to need a foreign key structure function. In other words, because what we are trying to do here is to join a one to many relationship, you need to know uh, how, what is the key on the many side of the join that tells you what is the attribute that needs to be joined with the one side of the join, okay? So in this case, let's say that we have two tables, user table and an address table. Let's say that we can have multiple users sharing the same address. So in this case, the key structure, structure function is going to be the get address method. This is the user needs to have a way of telling how I'm going to get the address ID in order to join with the address table. Okay, this is what this operation is doing. Just saying, whenever you get a user, call the get address ID method. This is going to tell you what is the ID you need to use to join with whatever addresses that we have on the address table. Okay, and that's it. Very similar to the other one, just uh, having this. Uh, key structure function, okay? Okay, um, time to move on a little bit more. <clears throat> okay, so far we have seen just the regular joins that everybody knows as inner joins. There are two more uh, types of, of joins, which are left joins and outer joins. Um, Inner joins that we saw before um, <clears throat> only return data when both sides of the join is met. Okay, this is an important difference. Left join, it only returns something as long as we have the left side. When you get the left side, you get something. If the right side is not available, you get null. If the right side is available, you also get it joined with the right side. Another join is is just returning whatever you have if you get the left side uh, but you don't have the right side you're gonna get the left side with now because the right side doesn't have nothing or the other way around if you get the right side but you don't have anything on the left side you're gonna get now and then the right side okay here in this table below i'm trying to represent the data that we are getting on either side the left side we get for example here record one user, record two user two, and then the right side we get uh, record two address two and record three address three. The, the, the first part is the key and after the column is the value, okay? 
obviously the key needs to match. That's what the John is doing in, in here. <clears throat> so let's let's analyze how the different joints behave based on the values that we have here. In the first case, for an inner joint, the one that we saw previously, if I get a record with key one on the left side and I don't have any correspondence on the right side, the, the joint doesn't get triggered and it doesn't produce anything at all. That's why you see this blank. Then after that, if I get the user two with the address two, all right, because they share the same key, the join is 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 uh, successful, and then we get the combination of both. We get the same key, and then the two records get joined together. And finally, if we get the record, uh, no record for the user, but we get the address three. Same thing as previously. We get nothing because we don't have anything to join with. Now let's see what happens when we get a left join. The left join only needs to have the left side uh, um, satisfied. Uh, we don't need the right side. So in this case, we don't have the right side. That's fine. Then we, we set it to now. Okay. And then here we have the left side. Yes, it's user two. Do we have the right side? Yes. And then we can also get both. But then finally, if we only get the right side because the requirement of having the left side is not met, we get nothing. Okay. And finally, just to complete this uh, example, to see how the outer join works. So in this case, we have user one on the left side. We have nothing on the right side. And then we, this is what we got. So this is exactly what the outer join is returning. User one and now, okay? Because there is no address. That's the, the, the meaning of now here. Following that, we are gonna see something very funny or at least unexpected is we get address two at some point in time and maybe a millisecond later or a minute later or an hour later, whatever it is, we're going to get the left side. Obviously, you, we are not going to get both simultaneously at the same time. That's not going to happen. Always is going to be one before the other. So here, if we get address two a little bit before than user two, we are going to get the first record, which is, okay, a half address two. I don't have the user yet. Because it's on its way, but I don't have it yet. So then I produce null plus address two. When the user two arrives, the join gets executed again. And then it produces the combination of both user two and address two. That's why this is triggering two records. And finally, here we are getting only address three. Okay. So that's why we get address three and, and the user is set to now. Okay. So I, I hope this table helps understand how how the different types of join work. Okay. Uh, now we are gonna talk about something pretty pretty interesting in the in in Kafka, which is how to bring in data and how to get data out of Kafka and place it wherever you need. Okay. So. <clears throat> Kafka Connect is a tool that allows us to bring in data or take the data wherever we want. The, the, one of the most important things is that it's scalable and you can rely on it. It's a very solid application. It's, uh, it, it works on its own cluster and there are two types of, of connectors. The, the ones that bring the data in the cluster is what we call uh, source connectors the ones that take the data out of the cluster is what we saw and call uh, sync connectors. If you are importing data source connectors, if you're exporting data sync connector, the number of connectors is huge. And if there is one not supported here, you can also implement it yourself. So you can have sources like file or MySQL or the Java Day JDBC or bring data from Kinesis in, a, in AWS or whatever you want. And the same way, you can also export your data to different 
sources like S3 or another database or Hadoop or whatever you want, or even call an HTTP service or whatever you like. Okay. <clears throat> Kafka Connect comes with a very, very cool feature, which is SMTs, which are single message transforms. Basically, these are just small functions that allow us to do simple changes, simple transformations directly in the in the in the connector. It's something that you don't need to write code for. Most of them are already built in. Um, and here we are gonna just quickly review three of them that are very popular. So the first one is insert field. For example, let's say <clears throat> this operation allows you to insert uh, a field using attributes from a record metadata or configure static value. So if you wanna, for example, add uh, like a static value to your records because the source system doesn't give you that or because this, the target system doesn't, you wanna maybe put like a, a another attribute that your record doesn't have, you can use this, this function in the connector and then simple change that you can do there, you don't need to modify your application and then you can do these uh, small changes on the fly. The next one is the replace field that allows you to filter or rename fields from the connector side. <clears throat> and, the, and the last one, the value to key is tremendously important. Often, oftentimes what you see is that you bring in data from the different sources, but then for some reason, maybe the topic was is not having the right format and maybe you get the, the key set to no and the value is containing the key. Maybe you get JSON content because you're reading a file and maybe you have an attribute that is ID. So what you're gonna see is the key portion of your message is gonna be null, but inside the, the value, you have an attribute that contains the key that you would like to have in the key. So by using this function, you can extract the value from the from the body side from the value side of your record and place it in the key and this is extremely important if you want to make sure that your records get partitioned correctly and then you can process it in the right order remember before when we discussed about about um all records are read in the same order, it's very important that they are placed in the same partition. If the record, if the key is null, what happens is Kafka doesn't know where to place it. So it's basically using a round robin approach and every time it's just using one of the partitions to place the record, it doesn't know what the value is. So maybe uh, the, the content is gonna be located in different, in different partitions and this is, can give you a lot of uh, concurrency problems. And if there are a lot of SMT functions, if none of them works for you, you want to do something more precise, you can, you can implement your own. Another thing I didn't say here is that you can combine multiple functions, okay? It's a very popular thing that you can do, that you maybe do divide your, your transformation in more than one step, and then you do like con concatenate multiple uh, SMT functions. Okay, so as we are approaching now to the end of the session, we are gonna talk now about a few things that you need to know about scaling your solution. Okay, one, one important thing here is the, the concept of, of log retention and cleanup policies. So you create your application, you start getting data in your topic, or maybe you're producing data in a target topic, um, as you can see here, uh, the, by default, uh, Kafka is going to keep the data for seven days and after that it's going to be deleted. So this is done by setting these two properties the way you see here. We, ha we have by default the cleanup policy set to delete and this is the number of milliseconds of seven days. After that, the data is deleted. If you want to, if you want to change the cleanup policy and then instead of using delete you want to use compaction you want to enable compaction in your topics you need to set it to compact okay 
um, uh, another thing is that otherwise, if you don't, if you are not careful here, and you don't do, and you don't enable, and you, if you are using tables, okay, and you don't enable compaction, you forget about that. You leave delete. What is going to happen is that after seven days, your data is gone, and then you're going to scream a lot. And this is something that you better don't learn the hard way, okay? This is because tables rely on change log topics, as we discussed previously, keeping track what is the last value. Normally, when you create a, a table, this is a persistent storage that you want to keep on for a really long time, uh, over time, actually. Uh, you want to query your data, or you want to join the, your data any time in the future. You just don't want your data for a few days. You can change the number of days, and maybe you can put a year or whatever, but it's going to be a, a point in time in which your data is going to be deleted unless you change the, the cleanup policy. Uh, so this is a, a very important thing that you need to remember here. And then we said, that for tables you need to enable compaction, but we didn't have any chance to actually talk about how compaction works and what is this exactly. So for every record, uh, as we mentioned, the compaction mechanism is going to make sure that keeps the last message. All right. So there are multiple things I've seen that people get confused about compaction. Um, Compaction cannot be triggered on demand. It's not, you cannot have any assumptions on the uniqueness properties that you get when compaction gets executed and is exclusively intended to save storage. Okay, that's the idea. Just to save storage. You don't have control on when it gets triggered. You cannot assume that it's going to be unique when it gets triggered because you don't know when it gets triggered. Okay. If you are super lucky and then you process your record exactly right after compaction is executed, maybe you're right, but you are not going to have guarantees to to uh, repeat that behavior in the in the near future. When uh, by default uh, the compaction gets triggered when when we produce either more than one gig of data in the topic or there are more than seven days since, since the last compaction run. And the good point is the offsets remain the same. This is critical because consumer groups and other type of consumers keep track on which is the last record it was read. The offset is just telling you the location within the topic of the last record that you processed. So for example, here, let's say that you, we have like a, um, a topic. This table here is representing a topic. These are the different values, the different keys that we are pushing to, that we pushed to the topic, and this is the associated value. So <clears throat> when the compaction gets triggered, it starts processing all the keys, okay? And it only keeps the most recent value. So for example, for key one, you see is here and here and here, but this is the last instance for, for, for key one. There are no other key ones after this one. So that's why the last value is, is stored here in the new topic that is produced. This is topic, the old topic. This is the new topic that is produced after compaction. And if you see here, we are also keeping the offset, which is three, and the value and the key, um, both obviously the key and the value. So the same thing happens for, for key three. You see here, we have key three here. This is the only instance that we have here. The only time that we pushed a record, the last one, but specifically, which is the most important thing. And this is why it's pushed here. And this is the offset. The same thing happens for key four. We come here, we see key four, which is pushed here for the last time. And it's pushed all the way here. For example, for key two, as you see here, we got it multiple times here and here and here. This is the last time we got it, and this is why it's put here in the new topic. 
And the, the, as I said, very important thing is that we keep in the offsets. This is extremely important. Otherwise, the, we will be breaking the consumers. They, will, they wouldn't be able to process the new topic that we are producing after compaction. Okay. All right. Um, when, when we have multiple members in a consumer group, we need to have a way of assigning partitions so that every member in the, in the group knows what partitions is expected to process or needs to process. Um, the process that determines uh, how, how partitions are distributed and assigned is partition rebalancing. When you start an application in Kafka, the first thing that happens is a partition rebalancing. Basically, the application checks how many how many topics you are gonna consume, how many partitions you have for each topic, and it starts sharing, it start assigning the partitions across all the all the members of the consumer group. If there is a single member, you know all the partitions are gonna be assigned to you. If there are two members, they should be kind of evenly distributed. If there are three, you should receive one third of, of those partitions. You don't know exactly which ones, but you know just a third of the partitions are gonna be assigned to you. So partition rebalancing gets triggered. Whenever we get new members that are either added or whenever we have members that are either added or removed from a consumer group. Also, if we change the number of partitions in the topic, you can, you can have like a, a topic and maybe you need to increase the number of partitions because you're going to increase also a lot the number of messages that you're going to push and you know that under the new conditions you're not going to be capable of processing your data in a timely manner with the current number of partitions in that case you might need to grow that this is perfectly doable and you can do that that's fine you can increase the number of partitions anytime you want and there should be no problem especially if your application is stateless when your application is stateful you need to be very careful because this could have some side effects that you are not uh, your application probably is going to do very weird things if you do that um, also you cannot reduce partitions just by the way for you once you increase the number of partitions they need to remain that way or or increase even further <clears throat> there are uh, two protocols that were supported, or they are supported in, in Kafka. There is an old protocol that is called, uh, known as Eager, that basically every time the partition rebalancing is triggered, all members of the consumer groups are uh, indicated that they need to revoke the partitions. So there is like a full, they need to stop processing whatever they're processing. They need to say, okay, I'm not processing this partition. I'm gonna wait how partitions are gonna be reassigned and wait for my assignment. And after that, they, go, they every member resumes processing and the new set of partitions. But recently there was another, another protocol that is the cooperative one, which is a lot better. It improves a lot the performance and helps a lot. Basically, the idea here is okay. If if um, if uh, <clears throat> we need to, if for example, we increase the number of partitions, and maybe I have three in a in a topic, I increase to four. There is only one partition that is unassigned. The other three are fine if they go if they continue uh, being assigned the way they are. I just need to assign that new partition, so there is no need to revoke the existing ones and stop the processing for those partitions. I can just assign the new partitions and every other partition being, being assigned the way it is. So this is what the cooperative approach does. Uh, okay. Um, okay, one, one thing that you sooner or later, unfortunately, you are gonna see in your application is that you have like an application Maybe you are processing one or two topics or whatever number of topics, and after um, and after a while, your application gets kicked out of the group. So to understand that, we first need to to see um, the or understand the the how why why that happens. 
they are the every time that uh, that a member consumes a uh, a record or, or every time a member is of a consumer group is running it needs to prove that the the member is is sound and uh, sound and healthy that every that the member is is just fine and there are two two health checks that need to be satisfied the first one is heartbeats but the fall heartbeats occur every every three seconds and the member needs to make a call a heartbeat call to the cluster saying hey here i am i'm alive i'm working fine you know that i am okay the next call is the poll interval the poll interval is the a call that needs to be done every 30 seconds or whatever configuration you set but the fall is 30 seconds to to pull or to poll and um, get more more records um, more messages um, and so when you are polling you are also committing the previous batch of records that you got so let's say for example that you uh, start your application then you do a poll you get 500 records you start processing 30 seconds later or before you you make another poll call you get another 500 what happens is you are committing the previous 500 and getting another set, another batch of 500 records. And that's why it's important the poll call that needs to be invoked. When you don't do a heartbeat call after 10 seconds or whatever the session max timeout is configured, or when you don't do any poll calls within 30 seconds or whatever the max interval call time you set, the call, um, Kafka is going to interpret that as that your application entered in a zombie state and it's going to be kicked out of, the, out of the group. And when that happens, and a rebalance is going to be triggered and the partitions that were assigned to that member are going to be reassigned to other members. Okay, So this is a very important thing why the cooperative approach helps here because you don't need to fully stop the whole thing. Let's say, for example, that you have a very wide topic with a lot of partitions because you're getting massive volume of data. Maybe you have 100 partitions and maybe you have 100 instances. If just one of your members get kicked out of the group and you're using eager protocol, all remaining 99 uh, consumers needs to be fully stopped, stop processing, and wait for Kafka to reassign the, the 100 partitions again. Okay, so this is a very bad thing that could seriously impact the performance. On the with the cooperative approach, you just need to assign one partition. The remaining 99 are gonna continue processing normally, and it's not gonna impact the performance. Okay, so well, I think you need to to know is when processing these are these parameters, same as uh, almost everything is configurable in in. Uh, in Kafka, sometimes you need to adjust and increase these parameters, especially the, the max poll interval parameter is most likely that you're going to need. The session timeout and the heartbeat frequency is very unlikely that you need to do that. Um, but you need to be mindful. If you put a very high values, what happens is Kafka is going to take longer to identify that one of your members got entered in a zombie state and is your the partitions that got assigned to that to that member are gonna take longer to be pro, uh, processed by a new member. All right, so careful with that. You always need to uh, use common sense and caution when 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 changing your configuration. Don't don't be like uh, too aggressive, putting like really high values or high and really low values. Always. And try to be conservative there. Okay, <clears throat> here here we have a, another important thing, which is transactions. Transaction is the ability that Kafka has to write across multiple partitions in an atomic way. Okay, this is absolutely essential feature in order to support exactly one semantic that we saw before without this feature is simply impossible to support that okay so you are you're doing an operation in multiple or, and also this this feature is is uh, very important if for example let's say that you have um let's say you have 
you are doing, you have two topics. Once, for example, you have your transactions for a bank, you're doing a, like a transfers or something. And then you have another topic in which you are keeping track of the balance. If you do a transfer, you need to update the balance. And then you need to make sure that the balance and the transactions remain in sync. If the balance is updated, it's because you have a transaction or a transfer. If, if, you, if, if you write a transfer, you need to update the balance. Either both occur or none, but you cannot enter, you cannot run into any hybrid situation because that would be inconsistent. With the use of transactions, you can achieve that. And how does this work? Okay, so what happens is the producer requests the transaction coordinator to start a transaction, okay? Then the producer starts sending messages to all the topics that are part of the transaction. And at some point they need to say, okay, I'm done, I wanna commit my transaction, all my messages are good. And then for that, we start a two-phase commit process, okay? And the first phase, we are committing the transaction lot, and in the second phase, we are committing the, the messages. And after that, the transaction completes. Using a very funny <clears throat> analogy, I, learned, I read in a book some time ago, this is like, <clears throat> if you have two guys that are in love and they wanna get married, so they go to the church and they ask the priest, which is our transaction coordinator, hey, we're going to get married. So then the priest, uh, they say, ask the, the, the groom, do you want to take Mary as your wife? And then he says, yes. All right. So in that moment, we are on phase one. You have been asked that whether you want to commit. If you say yes, you cannot roll back. There is no way back, okay? The only one that can do that is uh, the priest, which is our transaction coordinator. You said, yes, that's fine. Your, your side is, is now closed. You cannot go back. After that, the, 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 the bride is asked the same way. Do you want to take um, Ben as your husband? And when she said, she says, uh, yes, the same thing happens. You cannot roll back that, okay? And then, when when the the priest that is our transaction coordinator confirms that both accepted to commit the marriage or to complete the, mar the, the marriage, the, the transaction is done. Okay. All right. So here we this is uh, I'm gonna explain here how to use custom in the importance message. This is what our demo that I prepared today is gonna be about. <clears throat> so this is something that is not supported by Kafka out of the box. It's something that you need to implement your, your on your own. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, explain a little bit everything, the situation, so that you get a little bit of, of context. So. As a consumer, sometimes you want to subscribe a general purpose topic, meaning that has generic data that is used for different goals. And maybe you, you, you get more attributes that you need. You are only interested in a subset of the attributes that you're getting in every record that you're reading from that general purpose topic. You might, you might need to normalize your data or maybe you need to invoke an external service or something. Um, so more attributes means that those extra attributes could change and every time they change, you are also gonna get those records cascading down to you. So your application needs to make more calls than necessary and that takes time and costs you money because sometimes those validation normalization services work in a, in a pay as you go model and then every call you do you need to pay maybe a one cent or whatever but if in the in the if the the rate of calls is, is high it could have a significant cost another thing is you are also putting more pressure in the applications downstream you are maybe normalizing the data, but the applications that are reading your outcome are gonna be under more pressure than they should be, all right? 
So how can we address this situation? Okay, so the answer is we need to implement our own custom idempotence layer, okay? This is not the same thing as the idempotence uh, feature that comes built in in, the, in Kafka. The idempotence feature is just setting a header and if there is a network bleach, it takes care of replaying or, or retrying the record. Here we are looking at the content of the of the record, okay? So that's why it's customized importance layer. So it's you, the one deciding which attributes are meaningful to you and based on that, making the decision whether any, any of the attributes that came to you are the same that you got previously or not, okay? So here I, I prepare like a high level flow diagram that you can see uh, here. Basically, like we have the input data here for our application and then we apply some preconditions that you can determine whether your record meets meet your criteria or not. If it doesn't meet your criteria, you discard it. If it does, you let the data go through. And then here you need to implement like a, a transform, which is a type of operation. This is a stateful operation, by the way. And then this is gonna persist the, the, the record in a state directory and compare every time you get a record, compare with the previous value to see if, you, if the record remains the same or it has any changes. And based on that, you evaluate whether the record comes with new data or not. If the data is the same, you're gonna discard it. If the data is new, you're gonna let the data go through. And then in that moment, you're gonna map it. In here, we are representing that you, we need to make a call to external service to normalize it and do whatever you want. And after normalizing your data, you just produce the, the content in the, in the output topic, okay? I hope this is understood. And now we are gonna just show here the code a little bit, very, very quickly. So, um, and any questions before before I get started with the demo? I hope it's, it's easy to understand. We are go I'm gonna share later the diagram again when we see the topology of the application. Okay, so, so here you can see this is just a simple uh, object, simple, uh, Bing that we have created here with a lot of attributes. You can see all the attributes that we have here, all the, all the red dots that you see here is the list of attributes we have. There are a lot, but in our case, we are only interested in the ID, first, middle, and last name, and the address. Okay, we really don't care about phone number or emails or timestamps or IP addresses. So this is general purpose record and it contains more stuff that we want. As you see, we are implementing the equals and hash code only annotating the, the properties that are meaningful for us. We are not, we are completely ignoring everything else. This is an important thing, and then you're gonna understand later when it's used. This is the normalized record. As you see, it's only containing the attributes that are meaningful for us, the ones that we really care about. Every other attribute that we have got in the, in the raw record is simply ignored. And here, this is the, the code. This is the important thing. There are other things, but we will not need to dis get distracted. So here we are just preparing the serializer and the serializer for the raw record and the normalized record. No need to worry much about that. Here we are creating our stream and reading from our configuration file, reading the, the from the input topic. We are creating a stream here and saying, okay, the key of my record is gonna be stream type and the, the value is gonna be like the, the bin. The, the class that you saw here with the serializer and the serializer we are passing here. And then we are creating here a data store, all right? And uh, that we are gonna use in our transform. That's that we are passing below, okay? And uh, don't need to worry much about that here. This is the topology. This is the important thing. And this is also what you saw in the in the previous in the previous diagram here okay you see that we got the precondition the transform and we compare and then we compare again to see whether there is new data or not and then we map it 
Okay, and that's what you see here. Okay, the filter, the transformation, the filter to this, decide whether it is there or not, and then we map it. The, the first thing is we are going to check in the filter whether the key of the record is null. If the key of the record is null, we are going to drop it. We really don't, we are not interested in records that don't have the key portion of the record populated. If the, if the value is null, that's fine, it can go through, but the key needs to be populated. After that, we are going to call transform. And as you see here, we have a class in which we are passing the name of the store um, some properties. The, here is where we do the comparison. And when we are storing, every time we get a record, we compare it if we got the same data or not. So this is the, the important part of the transform. Here we get a record. This is the new value that is coming in. And then what we do is using the key and the, and the, the state store, we go and check if we have a value with a given key. For example, if we are getting user, maybe user one was already populated or was already processed. So I'm going to pull whatever value I got. So if the new value is null and also the old value is null, meaning I didn't get anything at all. I'm just discarding this and returning like an option. This is like an empty container having nothing. But if I got an, uh, the new value is null, but the previous one is not, I'm going to drop it. I need to delete it from my store. My record is deleted and I don't need it anymore. And then I produce a Tom Stone record. Okay. The Tom Stone record here, we are using like a little trick, is using like creating like an instance that represent Tom Stone records. And after that, then the next case scenario is compare the two objects. In non, none of this scenario, if my value is non null, okay, I need to compare the two. If they are the same, if I don't see any difference, and this is where the equals comes in. The equals here is only considering these attributes that are annotated. If they are, get a change in any of the other attributes, I know I'm, I'm not going to look at, look at those. I really don't care about the other attributes because they don't have any meaning for me. Okay. So when I say that two records are the same, is they are the same considering only a projection, only the attributes that they care about. If they are the same, I'm going to return an empty container, nothing. The same value is the same, so I'm going to discard it. I don't need it. But if I reach this point, that means that the record is new or has been updated. There is something different. In that case, I'm, I'm going to update my store so that the next time I need to compare, I have the record updated. Or if it's the, uh, the first time, I'm going to just store it for the future and then return the new value in the container. OK, I think you get it quite simply how this is working. So after that, when we get the values as they are processing here, we are going to get the container that we said before. If it's empty, this is going to be not satisfied. So those records that are empty are going to be discarded. OK, and only records that are coming here are either tombstone records or just regular records. So here, we're basically what we are doing is transforming tombstone records to null or extracting the value from the record. Um, here we are just doing the, 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 the mapper. We are calling the mapper. The mapper is, is this class in which we are getting the raw users that we know that are either new or contain a change in an attribute that we really care about. And here we are simulating the situation that we are calling an external service, for example, normalization service. And here we are artificially implementing some delay, like from between 100 and 500 milliseconds. And just printing something here, say, OK, I'm waiting. Actually, I'm waiting for that time. And after that, just mapping out all the values in my new normalized bin. This is the, the new record I want to produce for 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 the output so so here this is the output that i'm producing here this is the new object i want to generate okay so after that in the output string we just we don't we we just get normalized users as you can see here 
and then the normalized user are pushed to the to the output topic and that's what the application does okay any any questions so far i'm gonna run it before that i'm gonna show you something else first thing is that test is passing important thing we are here verifying that everything is 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 fine it's working correctly um let me show you the data that we are gonna use for our test. This is the data, okay? I have in reality five users and I have 11 records. The, the first part here, or this portion here, represents the key of the record, which is always matching the ID attribute in my case, all right? Um, the name, the first name represents is with the, with the, is also first name one, first name two is associating with the key so that we can easily see. Okay. And then as you can see, the data is almost always the same, but if we go to the end, you see that there is an attribute that is always changing which is the activity timestamp, last activity timestamp. It's always different. And also the IP address is always different. Okay, so there is something different in all my records. I'm not pushing the same data multiple times. It's just there is something different. What happens is the attributes that are different here are simply uh, not of my interest. The attributes that are of my interest are at the beginning. If I go here and just select not that much let me go to here all right and then i go and create a new record here and then format it i forgot to copy the copy brace i think hold on a second from key uh, there we go. Okay, and then you can see that this is the record that we are going to process. You see first name, last name, and everything. This attribute is always different. This attribute is always different. All right. Let me close this. Don't save. And then what, what we are going to see is that here we get user 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are new. Those, those five records are going to go through. Then record six, seven, eight, and nine, they are already processed. We got record one and two that are the same. Record three is the same again because the attributes that are of our interest are the, are the same. They didn't, they didn't get modified. And then record 10 comes with a new address, has been modified. So in that case, this record should go through because one of the attributes of our interest has changed. Then here again, another record has been pushed. So in total, we have 11 records. We should get these five records going through and the 10th record going through. Every other record, record six, seven, eight, and ninth are gonna be discarded. And the last record is also gonna be discarded because it will be a duplicate. I hope everybody understands what the expected behavior is. Okay, so before I run the application, I have a Kafka cluster running in Docker. Okay, and I can show you the here. Okay, so if I do Docker, yes, probably it's going to be faster. Docker Compose PS, you see that I have broker running, the single broker cluster, okay? And if we list the, the, the topics that we have in the broker, you see we don't have the topics, any topics created. This is an internal topics. All the topics that start with the double underscore are internal topics that belong to Kafka. So first thing we need to do is create the topics that our application requires. Okay, so we are going to copy just this, execute it to create the topics. Okay, and then hit enter key here. 
Okay, topic created, topic created, topic created. And let me now <clears throat> come here and list. Now, oh, oops, sorry for the typo. List, and then you see that now we had this topic before previously, and now we have three topics available here. All right, these are the three new topics. And then in the, in the below, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is use a Kafka consumer that is going to start listening to this new output topic. So whenever changes are going through, you're going to see those, those records going, showing up here. So we said that we are going to push 11, 11 records. So you should see five, uh, the first five records going through and then the 10th of record going through in total six records going through. Okay, so this application is just waiting for the data to go through and show up. Okay, and then we need to obviously start the application. There we go. And let me put the logs so that you can see something here. Okay, now it's rebalancing. Everybody knows what rebalancing means. And now that the partitions have been assigned, the application is running. Okay, so I'm going to delete this so that you can see the activity as the data goes through. Also, uh, another very important thing is I created here a simple script that basically is copying the, the file that I showed you before with the data inside the Docker. And then every second, this is having a sleep every second is um, showing the first 40 characters and submitting that record uh, completely to the to the topic so every every second we are going to push one one record to the topic and then we are going to see how how the data gets gets processed okay, let me do that okay and now I'm going to paste here. So just for you to follow what I'm saying, let me minimize this. So here you're going to see the application processing. Here you're going to be see the output. And here you're going to see the data that we are pushing. All right. So let me hit enter key. All right. So the application is processing. First record is normalized. It's going through. Second record is normalized. It's going through. You can see here. Third record is normalized going through. Fourth record is normalized going through. Fifth record is normalized as well and going through. Then sixth record is a duplicate, it got discarded. The seventh record got discarded. The seventh record got discarded. Ninth record got discarded. The next one should go through. The next record, here it is. It's coming with a new address. It went through, and then we get the same change again. It got discarded. Okay. So, <coughs> sorry. So, this is a very basic uh, conceptual exercise that we have done here to have full control on what the data we are cascading downstream and reduce a lot the, the cost, the resources, and do not put too much pressure downstream to. The systems that we have, we have uh, whatever system we have downstream consuming the data that we are generating. Okay, is it's very simple that you see here, but it's also important. Another thing that I want to show you just before finishing the demo is if I go now and list the additions. Oh, we got an extra guy here. What is this? Okay, so this is the change log topic because we have a state, a new internal topic was created, and this change log topic is persisted here. And then you can see all the data that is stored on this, which is containing RocksDB and is containing a, like a dictionary of key value pairs and is creating some file structures to keep track on, <clears throat> on the record on how to on how to uh, allow you to access locally to the data 
Okay, so <clears throat> that that's basically all I have to show here about the, the demo. Um, let me stop application. All right, not running anymore. Shut down this, uh, shut down this. Um, before we finish our presentation, I just want to quickly mention uh, the different uh, cases in which I think Kafka is, is a really good fit. The first one is, of course, to use Kafka as an architecture backbone. This is extremely useful if you have a distributed architecture, multiple applications coexisting in your in the cloud or whatever, and they need to exchange events or notifications. Kafka is a great choice if you want to keep them in sync. You can also send one notification that can be distributed to multiple different applications, each of them doing whatever they need to do, but Kafka works perfectly great for that. Another scenario is if you want to process payments or financial transactions in real time for banks, insurances, or for store changes. A great choice is to use Kafka to monitor events, such as maybe you are watching in a hospital what the status of your patients is. And if you, you are watching the events that are being produced, if the, you see that the heartbeat of your patients goes up beyond uh, above this uh, threshold, immediately do this or that. Okay. Also, if you want to track, uh, monitor your geo location events, for example, as we mentioned previously, if you have a, a car fleet or whatever, you can do this. Same for IoT events. You want to collect and process your data or you need to continuously do like analysis and processes of your data and maybe feed a dashboard or something. Generally speaking, I think every time that you need to do any event-driven data processing and you have a continuous source of, of events, then Kafka is going to be um, a good fit. Um, other than that, all I have to say is here you have some reference links of the documentation, different places I've used. Probably we'll be sharing this presentation with everybody. And um, if there are no other questions or any questions, just want to thank uh, Dani and Marcela. They did a great job organizing this event again. So thank you so much then for their effort. and. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining and having the patience to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for your talk. I think it was great. Uh, there is a lot of content uh, on it. So I hope the recording went well and that we can share it with our colleagues at the GDG and, and Singular. Thank you for uh, your time, Gonzalo, Dani, Victoria for being here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Carlos' talk and see you yeah. the next time. Have, yeah, a, thank you. have a great night. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye.